Hello everyone and welcome to the first part in our lesson on structural hazards. I'm Sophie Gill and I'm Matthew Kemp and we're both students at the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom studying earth sciences. Now what comes into your mind when you think about earthquakes? Damaged structures, collapsed buildings, people covered in dust and blood. It's not hard to demonise earthquakes but earthquakes actually happen because the planet is alive. And you may say earthquakes cause lots of fatalities, but actually it's not the earthquakes that kill people. It's the collapsed buildings and the contents of those buildings that kill people. Let's go to the Sichuan province in China. In 2008, a large earthquake there claimed the lives of more than 87,000 people, and 10,000 of those were school children who were trapped under the rubble of their collapsed schools. The buildings collapsed because they were weak and not up to standards. Some of the buildings in the region though, some of them schools, did stand up against the earthquake, and that was because they'd been recently renovated in order to withstand the shaking caused by the earthquake. So as we can see, some buildings stand while others fall, and the question is why? And that's what we're going to explore in this lesson. Now take a few minutes to think about the following questions. Do you think that your school is strong enough to withstand an earthquake? How would you go about finding out whether it was? What makes some buildings strong enough to withstand earthquakes and others not? And if I told you that there was going to be a large earthquake in your region, how would you go about finding out whether your school could withstand that earthquake? Feel free to share your own experiences with earthquakes if you'd like to. Have you ever been inside a building during an earthquake? What did it feel like? What did you do? Have you ever noticed any changes to buildings after there's been an earthquake? What were those changes and what did you do about them? We'll come back to you shortly to see how you got on. Now that you've had a chance to think about what makes a building strong or weak during an earthquake and the safety of your home or school, let's gather some simple materials and see how building models react when they're placed under pressure and motion. Your teacher will give you two cardboard tubes about 20 centimetres long. I want you to take one of them and bend it to about 90 degrees. And then Straightening it back out, put them both out on the table about 30 centimetres away from each other. And I want you to try and predict what will happen with each one when you place a heavy book on top of it. So remember to predict first and then have a go with putting the book firstly on the one that hasn't been bent and then on the one that has. We'll come to you after the break and see what you found. Welcome back. Let's see how you did predicting what would happen when you placed a heavy book on the two different tubes. We'll show it you ourselves. Okay, so I've got a very heavy earthquake and engineering seismology book that we're going to test this with. So here you yeah, go. Here we go. Here's the tube that we didn't bend to 90 degrees. What? Wow. Okay, that is really quite strong. Okay, and let's put it on the one that we did bend to 90 degrees. Not so strong. Yeah. Okay, so hopefully you can see that different shapes respond to different loads um, and some can withstand forces better than others. Um, so hopefully you can see that the circular tube can withstand quite a lot of load considering it's quite a small, quite flimsy structure in some ways. Um, but as soon as we've got a slight defect in it, as we've demonstrated with this 90 degree bend, it greatly weakens it. So different materials respond to loads in different ways. So stone materials, for example, can withstand compression fairly well. Compression means to press together like I'm doing with my hands right now, or to force into less space. Other materials such as metals like aluminium and steel, they can also withstand different kinds of stress if they're shaped correctly. And as you may have guessed, if you put two different kinds of materials together, so stone and metal, then they can withstand lots of different types of stress. Now let's gather some materials together to build your own model and see how it can withstand different loads. 
Now you can use lots of different materials for this. For example, we've got some styrofoam, we've got some string, we've got uh, some toothpicks, and we've got uh, paper clips. But really you can use anything that you have to hand. You can be as creative as you want to be. So take about 10 to 15 minutes to build your own model. And once you've built it, predict what's going to happen when you do three different things. Firstly, placing a brick or a heavy book on top of it. Then what will happen if you shake the base of it a lot. And then what will happen if you hold on to the base and then push horizontally on the top. So remember, you're only stating your predictions at this stage. Once you've actually built your model, make sure that you've had a chance to go over your predictions and then test your model by placing either a heavy book or a brick um, over the top of it. Then discuss your observations. What happened and why? We'll come back and see how you did. Welcome back. How are your predictions? We've made our model. It's made out of styrofoam and we've fixed it together using toothpicks um, and we've also added some corks on it for decoration. Matthew was being creative. Um, so yeah. Yes, how about we test it out. I predict that when we place a book on top of it, so a load on top of it, it's probably going to withstand that weight. Let's have a go. There we go. So the heavy item simulates the vertical force of gravity um, which every structure must carry. You may not know this, but styrofoam is actually very strong for its weight. So this extra weight that we put on top of it is me meant to represent all the other stuff that you have in a building, say the floor, the wall coverings and the electrical components as well. Some building materials are strong and can withstand lots of weight being put on top of them, but others are weak and can't withstand that much. So buildings experience horizontal forces during earthquakes, which can be simulated quite simply by pushing or pulling a structure from the bottom. These forces translate into compression, tension and shear, which transfer throughout the structure depending on how the structure is built. We're now going to gather some more material to build a simple structure that's strong enough to withstand the vibrations of a shake table. You can use the materials that your teacher provided you with earlier. You may ask. What is a shake table? Well, shake tables are used by earthquake engineers to try and work out whether their models are going to withstand any shaking. So whether their buildings, when they actually build them in real life, would be able to withstand an earthquake. Now here is our mini shake table. I'm going to take you through all the different components that make it up. So firstly, we have the base, which is attached to the upper platform so that it can freely move. So on the base, you can see these various holders with some marbles in so that it can move around. And then when you place the upper part on top, you can attach it to the lower part with four elastic bands around the edge. Now over here, we have all the electrical components. So here is the motor which can spin around and that's attached to the table to make it shake. This motor is attached to a battery and then this is attached to a potentiometer. And if you turn the potentiometer around, that will change the frequency to how fast the motor is turning around. The reason this is useful is that it allows us to investigate what effects on structures are from the ground motion during an earthquake. And the reason the potentiometer is useful is because it allows us to investigate what happens at different frequencies on these ground motion and then structures. So take some time to assemble your own building structure, but before you put it on the shape table, think about some predictions about what will happen when it's exposed to the vibrations of the shape table. Then place it on the shape table and have a go yourself. Think about your original prediction. What happened to your structure? Were you correct in what you predicted? And think about factors like the shape, height and weight of your structure that might have caused it to collapse if it collapses. Well done if it doesn't collapse. We'll come back to you shortly and see what happens.
Hello everyone again. How did you get on? Did your buildings collapse? Why or why not? Now, if we take our model here, I predict that when we shake it at low frequencies, nothing much will happen, but at high frequencies, I think we'll see some more excessive moving. Should we try it out? Yes, let's go. So do you want to hold yep. the battery and I'll turn the potentiometer firstly to low frequencies. So there we go. Hmm. Get higher frequencies. And back down to low. Sophie, what's happening here? Okay, so we can see the, our predictions that it would be a higher level of shaking of the structure at a higher frequency was probably not right. So we're get, actually getting more shaking, as you can see here, at a lower frequency than if you turn it up to a high frequency again. It's actually slightly, well, a bit's just fallen off the structure, but um, yeah, it's actually less shaking than when we turn it back down to a low frequency, where we can see the building really is shaking quite a lot. And the reason for this is that it's shaking more like this when the frequency of the shaking matches the natural frequency of the object, and this creates a phenomenon called resonance. And don't worry if you're a bit unfamiliar with any of these terms, as your teacher can go over them in the next break. Alternatively, you can check out the next video um, segment of these video series, um, and we'll be going through these terms in a lot more depth. So in conclusion, it's not actually the earthquakes that kill people, it's the collapsed buildings and the contents of them that do. We've learnt that different materials respond differently to lots of different kinds of loads. And we've learnt that earthquake engineers and technicians use shape tables to test out their models to see if they can withstand earthquakes. Now here are a few questions for you to take away. What would happen if buildings of different heights were stood next to each other and vibrating during an earthquake? Explore the limitations of our, our shape table to what happens in real life. And think about what the shape tables taught you that you didn't already know. And think about if you could modify the shape table in any way, perhaps to make it more reflective of real life situations, what would you do and why? Also, and finally, how about you find out whether your home or your school would be strong enough to withstand an earthquake and how would you go about finding this out? So we hope you found this video segment really useful and you're looking forward to the next instalment. Thanks and it's goodbye from us. Goodbye. Hello, I'm Matthew. And I'm Sophie, and we're from the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom. Thanks for choosing this video. This lesson, which should take around an hour, is quite a hands-on lesson, and there are lots of different activities to do. This lesson is the first of a two-part lesson on structural hazards. If you want to see the second part of this, then go on to the next video. Some of the different concepts that you may want to go through with your students before this lesson starts are the different stresses that you can put materials under, so compression, tension and shear. Also, the properties of different materials and what makes them strong or not. And also some terms such as frequency, natural frequency and resonance. They may have already learned this in their physics lessons. So in this video, we want the students to understand the concept that some buildings stand while others fall and that buildings can be modified in order to withstand the effects of earthquakes. The first activity is a discussion, so make sure to get the students talking with and engaging with each other. We asked the students lots of questions about their own schools in the first segment, so make sure they maybe focus on these during their discussions. If you've got any examples or good questions that you think would be a, a good idea to add into this discussion, then feel free to add them as you see fit. Make sure you're able to um, address the students' questions fully because some of them might be a little bit unaware about how to think about the safety of their own school during an earthquake. So make sure you do your own research and maybe talk to them about that during the discussion or after this lesson. At the beginning, uh, we'll show on this video various pictures of various earthquakes and we say about some examples. Uh, but if you have any pictures of your own or more pertinent examples, then feel free to use them. But of course, be sensitive to the students as they may not want to talk or be reminded of personal experiences. But of course, you are the best judge of that. Now, the second activity involves two cardboard tubes that we have here. 
And it's again a hands-on activity as with a lot of the activities in this session. So be careful as some items may be heavy or sharp. So we've um, demonstrated how to do um, this experiment during our, our segment. Um, so the students shouldn't find it too difficult to do this, but give them a hand if, if they're struggling at all. Um, the thing to remember is to get the students to predict what will happen before they do the activity with the tubes. So maybe getting them to write their suggestions on the board would be a really helpful, helpful idea. Um, and then allowing them to see what happens when they actually do the demonstration. In the next activity, we'll encourage the students to build their own models out of lots of different materials. Here we've got a few examples of them. We've got some styrofoam, we have some toothpicks, um, some paper clips, string, and lots of other materials. You can provide as many materials as you want, be as creative as you can be. Also, when we're testing these models out, we'll suggest for them to put heavy bricks or books on top. So be careful if these things are heavy, but also um, the students may not actually want to put their models under a heavy brick or a book because they think it may be destroyed, but that's actually the point of it, to show that some structures can't withstand these heavy loads, but assure them that they will be able to make more models in the future and that if they want to take them home, if you feel that's appropriate, then you can let them do that too. So activity four involves a shake table. It'll probably be slightly bigger than our mini shake table that we've used in many of our segments um, to demonstrate what we mean by a lot of the experiments. Um, but it can take some time to build and operate. So make sure that you've had a look at the instructions on the reference materials um, section of the video page. The shake table should probably be built ahead of time so that there's not any time wasted in the lesson having to assemble it. But if you'd like to involve the students in some of the later stages of the assembly to just make them feel involved, um, then feel free to do this as you see fit. Make sure that you know how all the parts of the shake table work, like the potentiometer, making sure that you know how the different frequencies can be gone through before the lesson, again, is a really good idea. Um, and always remember to allow the students to make predictions about what's going to happen at each stage of the experiments. Um, and again, getting them to write this up on the board might be really helpful for them to think about some of their ideas more clearly. Um, and then allowing them to then test their structures on the shake table after this has been done. In our final segment, we'll ask them various questions, which you can discuss if you have time at the end of the lesson, or they can take away and talk about at the beginning of the next one. Thank you for choosing this video, and we'll see you for part two.